Hi, my name is Margaret. I'm a PhD student in optics at the University of Arizona, and today I'll be talking to you about solar telescopes. So the first telescope was invented in 1608 by an eyeglasses maker just to see things that are further away on Earth. And then they were first used for astronomy by Galileo a year later. So how you make a telescope is by combining positive and negative lenses. Uh, positive lenses have a positive focal length, meaning their focal length is after the lens itself. And positive lenses converge light rays or make them get closer together. And then negative lenses or concave lenses uh, have a virtual focal point before the lens so that the light passing through gets further apart and you can see this dotted, light is an act, this dotted line is an actual light, but that's where the focal point is in the back. So the Galilean telescope has first a positive lens that converges the light, and then a negative lens that straightens it out again so that it's easier for us to look at. Uh, these are used because they have a pretty short length of the telescope and because they give you an image that's right side up so it's easy to look at. And the magnifying power, so how much bigger it'll look to you, is uh, negative one times the focal length of the objective lens, so this first lens, uh, divided by the focal length of the second lens, the eyepiece lens. And that negative sign uh, means that if you have two positive lenses, then you'll have a negative magnification or an upside down image. And if you have a mismatch, then you'll get a right side up image, like we do here with the Galilean telescope. The other way that you can make a telescope is by combining curved mirrors, which can do the same job as a lens, but they change the direction of the light. So a concave lens is like our positive lens, Oop. and the convex lens is like our negative lens, spreading the light out. A Cassegrain telescope is one of the simplest examples of a mirror telescope, which has a uh, two curved mirrors, and you have the same exact definition of the magnifying power. And they're popular because of their achromatic properties, meaning that they treat different wavelengths of light the same. Uh, the ease of manufacturing, because we can make them bigger and lighter for less cost, and that they're more compact, meaning that they can be shorter and still have the same magnifying power as a similar lens telescope. So now that we've talked a little bit about telescopes, let's think about uh, what we're using them to look at. So this is a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, meaning it shows the absolute magnitude, meaning the amount of brightness coming out of a star, and the effective temperature on the other axis. You can see that the sun is right here. And it's a little bit dimmer and smaller than most of the stars uh, in our universe that we've observed. And most stars lie along the main sequence uh, after they're born, including our sun and Sirius, which, even though it's not the brightest star on this map, is the brightest star in our sky based on how close it is to us. So let's think a little bit more about how the size and the temperature affect the color that we see and what we observe. So this is the uh, thermal spectrum because everything that has a temperature gives off light. And you'll see it gives off light not just in the visible spectrum, which is shown by the rainbow here, but also in uh, lower and higher energy light. And the sun you can see here uh, at 5,000 degrees Kelvin. And Deneb, which is in the constellation Cygnus, is 6,000 degrees Kelvin. And because of that, it's giving off much more of the blue light than our sun is. And that's what uh, shows up in our sky. And then Betelgeuse, which is a really red star, uh, shows off even less blue so that it appears to be red when we look at it. Now, the other thing that uh, creates light that we can see when we observe the sun is emission spectra and absorption spectra. And so if you've ever seen the Bohr model of an atom in chemistry class, that's what you're looking at here. And when light hits an atom, maybe it's coming from the thermal energy of the sun, for instance, it can excite electrons and bring them out to a higher orbital. 
And then after it's been there for a while, uh, it might emit that light in another direction because the atoms don't want to stay at that higher unstable energy level. And so if we have absorption from uh, atoms in space, then that would show up as a dip in the luminosity of the spectral line that we're seeing. And if we have emission, that would be like a spike. So absorption would be coming from, let's say, a cold cloud of gas, and emission would be coming from uh, excited ions on the surface of a star. So here we have the actual spectrum of the sun. So here's the ideal line that we would get if there was, no, uh, if there was nothing in between us and the sun, if it was just from thermal energy. And then we have here the real observed solar spectrum. And for instance, this little dip here is caused by the dip over here in the hydrogen absorption spectrum. So yeah, any dips will be from absorption and any peaks will be from emission. All right, so if we actually want to make these observations of the sun, we need to use telescope filters. Because as you can see here, even though we wouldn't want to look at the sun uh, with our naked eye anyway, because we're condensing all of this light, if we looked at, through a solar telescope without a filter, uh, it could be bad enough to blind us because we've concentrated all this energy in a small area. So sunglasses have about 18% transmission, 18% gets through, and solar filters have a 0.00001% transmission because they have to be 2 million times darker for them to be safe for our eye and for us to get a good image. So if we look with a white light filter, meaning a filter that's uniform across all wavelengths, then we can see things called sunspots on the surface of the sun. And sunspots are caused by cooler, surf cooler spots uh, from crossing magnetic field lines that aren't giving us as much uh, thermal energy or light from the thermal spectrum. Another way that we can look at the sun is with an H-alpha filter. And this is a filter with a spike of transmission, meaning it won't let blue through, for instance, but it will let a very uh, narrow bandwidth of red through. And this allows us to just look at the emission spectra of hydrogen and helium ions. So here are all the places where we have hydrogen and helium emitting from the sun. And that's how we see these explosions called solar prominences, which are made up of helium and hydrogen ions. So here's a better look at the transmission spec uh, spectrum of an H-alpha filter. And as you can see, we have these two lines on the hydrogen and helium spectrum that overlap on this area that is let through. And that's how we can see the solar prominences. So the reason that we care about observing the sun is because it helps us learn more about basic physics and the physics of other stars. It also helps us predict solar storms that impact us here on Earth. For instance, the entire power grid of Quebec went down in 1989 because of a solar, because of a solar storm. It also causes radio fluctuations and satellite damage, with a more dramatic case being when in 1979, a Skylab satellite had to fall to the Earth because of damage from a solar storm. It'll also impact the safety of future space travel because we want to be able to know that if we're sending astronauts into space for long periods of time, that we can protect them from these solar storms. Thank you for listening, and now let's observe. Hi, everyone. We're here outside the College of Optical Sciences at the University of Arizona, and we're observing the sun today. It is a beautiful cloudless day, and we are observing with a four-inch refractive Coronado telescope, and it is on a specialized tripod so that as the sun moves across the sky, the telescope will move with it so it stays in the center of our view. And as you can see here, we have a uniform filter on our telescope now, so you just see this big disk that is our sun. And right now there are no sun spots, but if we came back in a week or two, it's a very dynamic system, so we might have one new one, we might have two new ones, or it could be exactly the same. It's just our luck today that there are no sunspots. But if we want to see something a little more interesting, we can put in our H-alpha filter that we talked about before that just gives us light from hydrogen and helium emission especially. 
So let's flip that filter. And as you can see, we now have a bump on the edge of the sun, which is what we call a prominence. So it's an explosion of hydrogen and helium out of the surface of the sun. Thank you for listening and tune in again for more fun optics demonstrations from the University of Arizona.